right, so now we're going to learn about um, more background about how Mendel came up with some of his theories to solve for um, genetics problems. Um, first, it's all very based on probability. So probability just helps to really just predict a possible genotype and phenotype, which we'll talk about later, but pro um, probability just helps to predict results. Not to actually determine the exact result, but actually give us just a prediction. Um, so whenever Men Mendel performed a cross with pea plants, he carefully categorized and counted the offspring. So for example, whenever he crossed two plants that were hybrid stem, so big T, little t, about three-fourths of the results were tall, about one-fourth were short. So here's three and there's the one short guy. Um, so Mendel realized that the principle of probability could be used to explain these results. So again, prob probability is the likelihood that a particular event will occur. Not necessarily what's going to definitely happen, but the, the likelihood, the, the probability that something could happen. For example, if there are two possible outcomes to flip a coin, the coin may land either head or tail. So the chance of, or probability of either outcome is equal, um, is equal. Therefore, the probability of a single coin flip will land at heads is one in two chance. This is, a, you know, one half or 50%. So if you flip a coin three times in a row, what's the probability that it'll land heads up every time? Well, each coin flip is an independent re event, meaning your first flip is not going to affect the second flip. So therefore, the probability of flipping the three heads would be one half times the one half chance in the second time for getting heads, and then the one half chance of getting heads the third time. So that would be an, um, the chance of an eighth, they're one out of eight times of doing this. So yes, you have a one chance in eight of flipping heads three times in a row. Um, past outcomes do not affect the future one. So just example of like kids in a family. Um, just because you had a boy or girl the first time doesn't mean that's going to affect if you're going to have a boy or girl the second time. My husband's boss has like five boys, so um, so that does not fit the probability of what should happen, but it, it's a possibility. Um, just because you flipped um, three heads in a row doesn't mean that you're more likely to have a coin land tails up the next time because it's independent. So the way in which alleles segregate during gamete formation is very much like flipping a coin. So therefore, the principles of probability can be used to predict the outcomes of genetic crosses. So um, Mendel's cross produced a mixture when he did, you know, more, you know, crosses again. He had a mixture of tall and short. Um, the F1 or the offspring of the parents. Um, the F1 plant had one tall allele and one short allele, so big T, little t. Then half of the gametes um, they produce could carry the short allele. So here, um, here's the F1 plant. Um, these alleles split up into the gametes. So one gamete can have the big T, the, another gamete can have a little T. So you have a 50-50 chance between, chance between those gametes. Because the little T is the recessive um, trait allele, the only way that it can be that can it can produce a short plant is for two gametes carrying the um, recessive allele T, little t, um, if they combine, which we see right here. So each F2 gamete, so if you, again, if we crossbred the two F1s and made an F2 um, generation, um, each F2 gamete has one in two or a half chance of carrying the little t allele because we had two gametes that can fuse together that can have a little t allele. Um, so the probability of both gametes carrying the little t allele is, well, half the gametes from the first plant can have the little t, and half of the gametes from the second plant can have a little t. So if you multiply those two together, you get a fourth chance, which we see that result here when doing a Punnett square with those um, alleles. So this predicted ratio of three dominant to one recessive showed up consistently in Mendel's experiments. For each of his seven crosses, about three-fourths of the plants showed the trait controlled by the dominant allele, and yeah, a fourth of the plants showed the trait for the recessive allele, for the short plants. So not all organisms with the same characteristics have the same combinations of alleles. In the F1 cross, both the big T and big T little t allele combinations result in tall plants, and the little t little t allele combination produced short t plants. So organisms that have two identical alleles for a particular gene, like two dominant, big T, big T, or two recessive, little t, little t, are known as homozygous. So use context, information you know from common everyday language. Um, 
the prefix homo means same, so identical. Organisms that have two different alleles for the same gene, so having a dominant T, it's recessive T, are heterozygous. Again, use your common knowledge of prefixes here in everyday language. Hetero means different. So probability, probabilities, again, predict averages. So um, they tend to predict the average outcome of a large number of events. So the larger number of offspring, the closer your results will be to predicted values because you have, like, in essence, more trials. If an F2 generation just contains three or four offspring, it might not match Mendel's ratios because it's a small group, a small trial, pretty much. When an F2 generation contains hundreds or thousands of individuals, then the ratios usually come very, very close to Mendel's predicted um, ideas. So genotype and phenotype, I've used these words throughout a little bit earlier. Phenotype is their physical traits, so like the tall or short plants. Genotype is actual their ge genetic makeup or the allele combination. So genotype, big T, big T, homozygous dominant, or big T, little t, heterozygous, or little t, little t, homozygous recessive. So there are three different types. I just went through that. Okay. Um, the genotype of an organism is inherited, whereas the phenotype is formed as a result of both the environment and the genotype. Um, so two organisms may have the same phenotype, but different genotypes. So again, we have some environmental plays involved. So yeah, Punnett squares, very good tool to use for genetic process. Um, they can help you solve for the mathematical probability of different allele combinations for genotype and phenotype. Um, okay, independent assortment. So how do alleles segregate when more than one gene is involved? The principle of independent assortment states that genes for different traits can segregate independently during the formation of gametes, meaning one trait won't, doesn't affect another trait um, if they're undergoing independent assortment. So Mendel wondered if the segregation of one pair of alleles affected another. So Mendel performed an experiment that followed two different genes as they passed from one generation to the next. Because it involves two different genes, Mendel's experiments is known as a two-factor or dihybrid, so di meaning two, cross. A single cross would be a monohybrid, which mono means one. So doing a dihybrid cross here, two-factor cross, uh, Mendel crossed true breeding plants that produced only round yellow peas with plants that produced wrinkled green peas. So here's your true round yellow plants, big R, big R, little Y, or big R, big R, big Y, big Y. And your true breeding um, green wrinkled plants, little r, little r, little y, little y. Um, so all the F1 produced round yellow peas, which um, proved that the round and yellow um, traits are dominant. Um, so the Punnett square shows that the F1s all are heterozygous for each trait, meaning big r, little r, and big y, little y. So then Mendel crossed the F1 offspring to create an F2 offspring um, generation. Mendel observed that 315 of the F2 seeds were round and yellow, just like this guy here, and another 32 seeds were wrinkled and green, like this parent of the parent generation. But then he saw 209 seeds that had combinations of phenotypes, meaning we had some like round green peas and we had some wrinkled yellow peas. Therefore, combinations of alleles that were not found in, they were alleles that were not found in either parent. So the alleles, this showed that the alleles were seed shaped, segregated independently of those seed colors, meaning round is not always with yellow and wrinkled is not always with green. We can have them um, um, separate from each other and have green with round and wrinkled with yellow. So genes that segregate independently, such as the genes for seed shape and seed color in peas, do not influence each other's inheritance. So you don't have to have the round and yellow necessarily together all the time or the wrinkled and green together all the time. They can independently separate from each other. So Mendel's experiments results were very close to the 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio that we expect from this type of cross. Uh, Mendel had discovered the principle, therefore, of independent assortment. That again, the principle of independent assortment states that genes for different traits can segregate independently during gamete formation. So we can have some, for example, some sperm cells with the big R trait and the big Y trait. Um, well, like if you're looking at these guys, um, some of the sperm or egg can have the little R trait or the big Y trait or big R and big Y or little R, big Y. So you can have combinations of these two genes together.
because they can segregate independently of one another. Um, so summary here, why did, what did Mendel's contribute to understanding genetics? Did Mendel's principles of heredity observed through patterns of inheritance form the basis of pretty much modern genetics we have today? So in most sexually reproduction or producing organisms, each adult has two copies of each gene, one from each parent. These genes segregate from each other when gametes are formed. So again, we see that the two alleles here from this F1 plant, half of their gametes would have a big T, half of the gametes would have a little t, and the same thing with this one. Um, so alleles for different genes usually segregate independently of each other, which we saw in the dihybrid cross. And how this kind of helped with later on, at the beginning of 1900s, an American geneticist named Morgan decided to do lots of experiment with fruit flies because they're really nice to work with in the lab because they reproduce very quickly, um, which is always an ideal thing for a lab for seeing um, many different generations. So before long, Morgan and other biologists had tested every one of Mendel's principles and learned that they applied not only just to pea plants, but to all other, to other organisms as well. So the basic principles of Mendelian genetics can be used to study the inheritance of human traits um, which is of interest to us, and to calculate the probability of certain traits appearing into the next generation, which we can use that for like genetic disorders um, that are not just chromosomal based, but are gene based. So we'll be working with that um, a little bit later. Okay, that is it. Thank you.